I was given a very kind of easy topic to be discussed here, like digitizing retail. And the truth is that, that retail has been almost the same thing for the past 200 years. So we have been buying goods in the decent prices and trying to sell them out in a little bit kind of a higher price. And now everything is changing. I'm actually a very big fan of this guy, Jeff Davis, who said that everything that can be digital will be. And this is a very, very old quote, already back in 19, mid-19s, I would say. And I started my digital journey like late 1990s. And when we were thinking about this one, this, this kind of felt like a, a science fiction, because we actually lived in, in the totally analog world. The world was really, really analog, and it took like 20 years to get us here. And a very well-known truth that um, we humans tend to overestimate the impact of the technology in the short run, uh, and underestimate that in the long run, has really proven to be true now. Um, you might have no noticed that the world is changing really fast at the moment, and the change is actually faster than ever before. But on the other hand, the change won't be tomorrow or in the future as slow as it is today. So this is kind of the your slowest day in, in the cha change uh, so, so far. Um, and what is driving the change? I really believe that the digital technology is driving the change. With the help of the, the digitization, the world has become uh, smaller, the business has become global, and the technical I innovations can, can be spread overnight. And we have a lot of kind of uh, examples on that side. And what had this has done to the companies? Uh, if you have a look on the Standard Poor's Index, it's a kind of list of US com top 500 US companies. So you can see that the average life sp lifespan of the company has decreased by 50 years from last century until today. So today, the average age of the company listed on that index is 15 years. And it used to be almost 70, 70, 70 years uh, uh, last and during the last century. And then we also think that by 2020, 75% of the companies on that same uh, index will be companies we have not heard yet anything. Maybe Reima is one of them. And where do these companies come from? Maybe not traditional retail or re traditional process industry, but probably uh, from the from the uh, they originate from from the roots that have a really really kind of uh, much to do with uh, uh, digital in in its various forms. Me and Elena has the same consumer, I can see. So. I think that for me, the te technology as such is not important, but it, it's interesting and super inspiring to see that how we humans, how our customers uh, utilize the technology, how they make better relationships, how we can make better, better uh, decisions, or even little, make even the, this world a little bit better place to live. Uh, the guy called Douglas Adams, the, he wrote a book called Hitchhiker's Highway to Galaxy, or something like that, you know, Liftereiden Tie Galaxin. But he has also this le kind of uh, lesser known wisdom. He has thought about how we humans relate to technology. And he had come up with the three different categories. So the first one is the Elena's category. So when you are born to this world, you are under 15, everything that is kind of technology new and new around you is kind of self-evident. You just look at this and take it into your use. Then when you are between 15 or 40 or so, uh, the technolo 
technological kind of things are interesting, exciting, sexy, and you probably make your career on it or build your competencies on it. And then, when you are 40 plus, it's against the normal cycle of life. And the challenge for the companies, in my opinion, is that we all decision makers belong to the last group and our customers, they come totally from the different world. And this is kind of the thing we are trying to solve when we are digitizing retail now. Also, the, the kind of Finnish lady called Sara Taala, Taalas, who is professor in the Lund University in Sweden, has kind of discussed this same phenomenon. And he, she told that in, in his research, that there's a digital gap, gap between uh, 1964 and 65. And if you are kind of 1964, born 1964 or older, you are on the wrong side of the gap. If we are talking about the kind of understanding and adapt adapting digi digital stuff. Uh, but, and if you are younger, you still have some hope, even though you have a lot of work to be done. When we are usually talking about the kind of digitizing retail, the discussion very often starts with the e-commerce. But, but for us, the kind of e-commerce is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, digitization impacts everything what we do, every process, every function. It, it has uh, something to do with marketing, sales, data, how we are working. And the, maybe the biggest thing of all is that it changed organizational culture. And let's discuss these thing, uh, topics uh, uh, in the following. A modern store. We have thousands of physical stores. But for us, the modern store is a kind of physical store plus all the digital services around it. And evidently, it's super important that we win the client streams from the bo both worlds. It's not an easy task, because so far, the kind of Kesco has been in place for uh, 76 years. We have been focusing on developing physical stores. And then if we have to have time, courage or competencies, we have been thinking about the digital world. But now our customers really, really think that we have to build one seamless customer experience. And I really believe that the next battlefield for businesses will be in customer uh, experience, because price and goods brings you only par with the competition, and the customer experience is really the winning phenomenon. What the digitization has done, Elina told about putting the children in the focus, we had to put the customer in the focus. This might sound like a stupid thinking that, or somebody might say that, okay, that's always been the case. But think about Gesco as a wholesaler. We have had a kind of thinking that we are responsible for delivering stuff to the back door of this kind of uh, retailer store. And then the retailer has a responsibility to take care of the rest from the back door to the customer. Well, evidently, that's a broken process. And now for the past 18 months, we have been focusing on our common customer. And that really has helped a lot. We are trying to sell, uh, uh, solve our customers' challenges and everyday problems. And finally, we have a common language with our retailers as well. Data, this is my topic I love. The we have a lot of data. The amount of data is not a problem. And collecting the data is not a problem. We have this plus sub loyalty card program. It's covered 88% of the Finnish households. We have 3.7 million cards, individual cards. And this card brings us about 6 billion in revenue every year. So a huge number of money. And we collect a lot of data. People are happy to give the data because they get something in, in return. The big myth behind the data is that all the big, big data is valuable. But that's not a, not a case. You have to use it. And during the past 
past year or so, we have really trying to liberalize the data, to give access to data to everybody so that you can use it in your everyday life. We, for example, bought about 20,000 licenses that we are able to give the data to you in the format you are able to understand. That really helps, helps kind of the using, using the data. And why is data so, so super important? Um, I believe that every company is kind of software company as well. And how you manage a lead for software company, you lead it with the data. For us, we might say that every customer is, is a data file, and we just need to understand the data files much more better. It's not an easy task. We have, for example, 2,000 something retailers, and how you can read data it, it's difficult to some people. So it's also a very, very huge, big training exercise for us. We have to educate a lot of that, a lot of people. But I believe that in the future, kind of data literature is a kind of as important competencies as you can read or do your math work at home. That the future kids, they will be very able to understand what data will tell them. Data is super uh, important for us as well because it helps to change the culture. If you think about traditional companies, how the decision making has been gone previously is that the, kind of the, the, the highest bait manager or director have decided on everything because he has known everything. Now when you are, uh, uh, when you have opportunity to kind of give the data to everybody, you can also kind of put down the decision-making to the level where it be be belongs, and it really speeds up the processes. You don't have to ask for your uh, manager's permission anymore. A few examples how we use the data. This is a dashboard we have been given to all retailers in all hypermarket, supermarket, and K-market change. This is the these tables tell the retailer that how, how he's doing his business, how how, what kind of customers he's having, what, that, what are they buying, when they are buying, what kind of baskets they are having. And it also tells you about the competition. If they are not buying everything in your store, where they are going, and what's the potential in your area that you could have in, in, in your business as well. This sounds uh, kind of, a, might sound, sound kind of e very, very easy, uh, easy and, and kind of simple example, but actually it's not. We have been previously been delivering the same data to these same customers approximately in 40 different Excel sheets. And guess how many had ever opened the Excel sheets? Maybe 2% of them. Now they have this in everyday use. Um, this guy is Tony Pokela, who is running a big hypermarket in Espo, and he did a very big kind of concept renewal in, in his uh, shop in, in, in Iso Omena. And he has uh, public, publicly said that if he had made kind of the decisions based on, on the income statement or finance and only, he would have made really, really bad mistakes because he would have kind of put the service counters to minimum. Uh, he would have had narrow opening hours and so on. But when he combined the financial data with his customer data, he understood that, oh, my kind of customers are the most in kind of demanding customers in the whole country. And they value service. They value... Uh, quality and, and deep categories in such. So putting this kind of insights on the top of the data is really valuable for everybody. So combining data with a strong insight make your brief, briefcase very, very rich. We also deliver data to our customers. I hope that you all already have downloaded this Koroka mobile app. And what we offer you is based on your data. 
So this, for example, tells you that uh, we are able to give you personalized offers based on your purchasing history. So if you are vegan, you should not ever receive kind of uh, proposals from meat. The other thing we are giving you is recommendations. So these recommendations are based on your purchasing history. So you can get recipes that you would probably like. And then, of course, you can kind of see your plus account here, here in the mobile. We have currently 250,000 download, uh, uh, 250, downloads, and the number is growing all the time. And we have seen that if we are giving something relevant to our customers, they are willing to give them in information back. So it's kind of win-win difference. And we know that this is a very clear business case. The guys who have downloaded the app and used these kind of promotion, personalized promotions, they, their average kind of basket has grown by 8 euros a week, which means maybe 100 million in sales a year. So this has kind of paid, paid off very, 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 very well. And we, of course, want to develop it further. So data to our customers and data to our retailers. Um, digitization is very often seen as a technology exercise. I told to my boss the other day that, because we have a lot to do on the IT, IT sector as well, and, and I told that if you would give me 500 million, so that I would be kind of make very kind of smooth and nice APIs and all plat platforms kind of easier to manage and so forth, it wouldn't change anything if our culture wouldn't change. So technology is only the en en enabler, and you really, really have to focus on the culture and make the culture work for the strategy. For me, kind of organizational culture is like an ERP, ERP system for the, for the strategy. This means that if the system is broken, the strategy won't be fulfilled. So you just have to make the strat uh, uh, culture work for the, for the strategy. For us, this means, for example, tearing down the silos. We used to have a very kind of strong line organization. Now we have made a ma matrix on top of that. And I can tell you that being kind of 75 years in the matrix, uh, in, in the line, it's not very easy to ask to move to the matrix organization. We also have to be really much faster, and data helps with that, because data enables to, to you to do better de decisions, more decisions, and fast, faster decisions. So, super important. Make the culture work for the strategy. And then, of course, questioning where, what are you doing? I think that for every business, no matter how successful you are now, you should really be thinking that, okay, what's going up there? And what, how is that impacting to my business? We kind of traditional business people and businesses tend to think that, okay, not going to happen. Im impossible for us, have, have, have been trying before. Instead, we should be looking at the startups and new companies out there, what they see. They see only opportunities. There are hundreds of millions of euros or dollars in their startups, with, and they have only one kind of task to do, disrupt traditional business models. And I think we should do. We should disrupt our own business model, because if we don't do, somebody else do. And it's better to disrupt it, it yourself, uh, yourself first before, before the competition comes. Um, in my career, I have been kind of lucky and privileged to work for both the kind of new age companies and, and the traditional companies. And I can say that there's kind of big differences between the cultures. And, and this is very kind of a black and white approach, but there's a, a little bit truth in there. So why the new age companies, and within new age companies, I, I mean companies who are born in digital era, 
how they are set up. They are set up to be very uh, flat, flexible, fast. Their ambition levels is totally in the, in the other planet compared to traditional companies. They are looking for the uh, big growth from exponential growth. They are not looking for the zero point something market share growth. They really think that where they can build a bigger business than the existing one now. And the kind of the look is also not in the present, it's in the future. And I think that traditional companies should learn from the new age companies because we are living in the same competitive environment still. And remember also the, the standard poor listings. Where do these kind of big new companies come from? Probably from, from this heritage. About the change, nobody knows, knows about tomorrow. We know that it will be different. And as in the kind of the previous um, presentation showed us, there will be new jobs. Some will go away. But I also believe that we it gives us a huge opportunities to do something more meaningful, to put our kind of expertise somewhere where there is a more value add. In the retail perspective, there will be lesser sales force. If you think about where, if you are in the, in the store, physical store, where are the most people? They are at the checkouts, at, at the cashier. And it's kind of, you know, no, no brainer to think that why somebody is lifting the stuff to the counter and then somebody is, is kind of uh, scanning it and then you are getting it back to the basket. So it definitely will change. This is something which will happen. We have a kind of endless computing power around us. And the, the, the computing power will do something to the mental power that the steam engine did for muscle power four decades ago. And this is a good thing, in my opinion. So it will co bring more prosperity to the world, more well-being to all of us, and also we are able to use our skill to something better, what it really, as I said, brings a value at. But still, it's really early morning on the web, ladies and gentlemen. It's been told that only 1% what is possible to be done is done, and there's still 99% available for us to get fixed. Thank you.